tribute to Barry Cryer. Barry Charles Cryer was born on the 23rd of March 1935. He was an English writer, comedian and actor. As well as performing on stage, radio and television, Cryer wrote for many performers including Dave Allen, Stanley Baxter, Jack Benny, Rory Bremner, George Burns, Jasper Carrot and many, many more. Barry Cryer was born in Leeds in the West Riding of Yorkshire in England to John Cryer, an accountant who died when Barry was five, and his wife Jean. After an education at Leeds Grammar School, he began to study English literature at the University of Leeds. Barry Cryer left university after learning his first year results and travelled to London. After impressing impresario Vivian Van Dam, Cryer began at the bottom billing act at the Windmill Theatre in London a theatre which showed comedy acts in between nude tableau shows. Cryer joined the cast of Expresso Bongo 1957 with Susan Hampshire, Millicent Martin and Paul Schofield, during which he recorded the song The Purple People Eater. thing a coming out of the sky one long horn one big eye i commenced a shaking and i said who we it looks like a purple people leader to me it was a one-eyed one horn flying purple people leader one-eyed one horn flying purple people leader what a sight to see well it came down to earth and it lit in a tree i said mr purple people me. I heard him say in a voice so gruff, I wouldn't eat you cause you're too tough. One-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater. One-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater. One-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater. What a sight to see. Then he lit from the tree and he's on the ground. Starting to rock, a really rocking around. It was a crazy ditty with a swinging tune. Bip, bop, a lip, a lap, a limb, bam, boom. Pigeon toad on the road, flying purple people leader. Pigeon toad on the road, flying purple people leader. He wears short shorts, flying purple people leader. What a sight to see. Then he went on his way, and what do you know? I saw him last night on a TV show. his head Blue Eyes got to university and blew it. Uh, I got a, now the young ones go into university in a state of debt, which is terrible. And I got into university free. My dad had died. My mum uh, was supporting me, but it didn't cost her to get me into university. I'll make this quick. And uh, I've, I'm BA England failed of Leeds University. Uh, because I was chasing girls and in the bar and all sorts. And my first year results showed it. But we did an, a university show at the old Empire Theatre in Leeds called The Rag Review. And a guy came up to Leeds to see somebody, not me, saw me telling jokes and offered me work. So if I hadn't been at university, that wouldn't have happened. So it's very strange looking back. I had a half-baked idea of being a journalist, I think. Writing was in my mind. But suddenly I was in pitchforked into uh, show business and I was in shows with titles like Fanny Get Your Fun and We've Nothing On Tonight. Have you got the picture? I was quite happy. I was, we didn't call it a stand-up. I was a stand-up in those days. We called it You Were A Turn or An Act. I became uh, the writer of a Danny Rue in nightclubs and one, Ronnie Corbett, my old friend, was in the show. I'd written it and we were both in the show and David Frost came in. 
I had submitted one or two bits and pieces for television from my bed sit. Dick Emery, who was a star at the time, I sent some jokes to him before this, I remember, and I was thrilled to bits one night. They did a joke that I'd written for Dick Emery, which is a man sitting watching television, and his wife comes in and says, there's a man here who says, I fought with you in the war. And Hitler walks in. <laughs> that was the first time I had anything on television. But nothing with continuity until Frosty arrived and invited me and Ronnie Corbett for a drink. And as a result, Ronnie went into the Frost Report and I became a Frost writer. <laughs> Dennis Norden was talking about another trend when he observed in a recent speech that every suggestive or controversial remark heard on television now seems to spawn an entirely new pressure group. Or as he put it, every little meaning has a movement all its own. <laughs> a movement like, for instance, the League of Television Decency. Uh, good evening. Now, tonight in the studio, we have the chairman of the League of Television Decency, Mr. Whitefoot. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> now, Mr. Whitefoot, Mr. Whitefoot, I understand that the purpose of your campaign is, in fact, to clean up television. Yes. We take exception most strongly to some of the double entendre and suggestive dialogue in BBC plays, for example. Now, would you like to give us an example? Yes, uh, willingly. Uh, the other night, a character, <laughs> a character was heard to say, and I quote, look here. <laughs> Yes. Well, that's all. Look here. Well, that sounds perfectly harmless to me. Well, it depends on which way you look at it, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> I mean to me, look here suggests look here through this keyhole at this young female person divesting herself of her clothing. <laughs> well, I must admit, I, I haven't seen it in that light myself. Well, that's what I immediately thought of, this young female person of the opposite, opposite SEX divesting herself of her clothing, standing there revealed in her flimsy undergarments with her bosom throbbing through the thin cotton <laughs> of this. I mean, isn't that what any decent person would think? Can you, uh, can you perhaps give us some, some further examples? Uh, yes, yes, I can. Um, in a play only last week, which was watched uh, by millions, a character was seen to pick up a telephone. Well? Well, don't you see? Don't you see the erotic imagery contained in that gesture? An ordinary telephone? Yes, of the type used by certain sick people. And take my word for it, they are sick, they are mentally sick. <laughs> sick! <laughs> the sort of people who phone up young female persons and breathe down the phone at them and say terrible remarks to wit, George is being unfaithful to you. George? George, is that's her husband, George, George. But uh, to, 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 to return to the play, I mean, surely no such event took place. Didn't it? Didn't it? No, it didn't. <laughs> something, something much worse than that took place. The actor was heard to say, and I have it written down here somewhere. The actor was heard to say, hello. Well? Yes. It makes one blanch, doesn't it? Visibly. I blanched visibly. Hello, he said. And we all know what that meant, don't we? Well, what did it mean? It meant, hello, what have we here? Surely it's a young female person divesting herself of her... <laughs> with her proud bosom thrusting up to... <laughs> I, I have the headaches, you know. I have to keep <laughs> Surely such remarks would only offend a small number of people. Exactly. That's what the BBC do. They go out of their way to offend minorities. I mean, look at some of the suggestive titles they have for some of their programmes. For example? Well, quick before they catch us. <laughs> United. <laughs> Blue Peter. The Bar Festival. <laughs> Two way family favourites. <laughs> Watch with Mother. <laughs> Mr. Whitefoot. Mr. Whitefoot, the BBC 
The BBC wouldn't intend to hurt anyone. Wouldn't you agree, surely, that evil is in the eye of the beholder? Exactly, evil is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> but you've got to know what you're looking for. Due to Frosty, I was doing warm-ups all over the place. Some of the... Oh, warming up Victor Borger. Ah. Uh, the great man. And, oh, I'd, in those days, you just got the phone call. One off, oh, one off special on the weekend down at Waterloo. Not here. Uh, Victor Borger and I put the phone down. I thought, are you mad going on talking before this great man comes on? So now you get it through on your laptop or whatever. I rang up and said, could you send me Victor Borger's CV? And I got it. And I went on that night to the warm-up and I just told him about Victor Borger, what this man has done. And I got the signal. The reason we're here tonight, Mr. Victor Borger. And he walked on, gave me a nice nod, and the show started. Hold it. There's a breakdown camera quite early on or something. He's not very amused, so he walks off. Get on. Get on, you're being paid. I was sent on again. We start the show, I guess. So once more, the reason we're all here tonight, Mr. Victor Borger. You couldn't make this up. A third time, there's a hold-up. Now he is not amused. And he walks off and he's leaning against the wall looking, I'm on again. And yet again I get the signal. And I say, yet again the reason we're here tonight, Mr Victor Borger. And I deferred to him when he walked on and he got hold of my arm in a vice. And he pulled me into his spotlight and he said, now you know the reason I'm here tonight. To fill in the gaps between Barry Cryer. <laughs> <laughs> not lovely from a star, not lovely. He hosted the ITV comedy panel game Joker's Wild from 1969 to 1974. It's Joker's Wild, with the country's top comedians batting it out to see who knows all the jokes. And keeping them in line, it's Barry Cryer. Welcome to another edition of Joker's Wild, in which two teams of comedians battle to see who knows the most jokes. And they battle for this, our Joker's Wild Trophy, a model of life-size model, indeed, of Les Dawson at the weekend. Let's meet the two teams who are going to battle on this occasion. From the top of the table, Captain Les Dawson, Hi, Michael man. Aspel and Davy Kay. <laughs> Joining battle with Captain Warren Mitchell, I, Tim Brooke Taylor and Lenny Bennett. Barry Cryer was one of the panellists on the BBC radio comedy programme I'm Sorry, I Haven't a Clue, which began in 1972. So it's your turn now, Barry, and uh, I'd like you to sing the words of I Predict a Riot by the Kaiser Chiefs <laughs> to the tune of A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square. <laughs> Watching the people get Larry It's not very pretty, I tell thee Walking through town is quite scary It's not very sensible either A friend of a friend, he got beaten He looked the wrong way at a policeman would never have happened to Smeaton An old Leodentian I predict a riot I predict a riot I predict a riot I predict a riot I tried to get to my taxi And the man in a tracksuit Attacks me He said that he Saw it before me And once again things a bit gory Girls scrabble round With no clothes on To borrow a pound For a condom Barry Cryer still enjoyed performing and appearing with Tim Brooke Taylor and John Junkin in the BBC radio series Hello Cheeky. Hello Cheeky. Hello Cheeky. Hello. Hello. Hello Cheeky. 
bucket. Mm, hello, Cheeky. Oh, hello, Cheeky. Hello. Hello. You're all under arrest. Here is a news flash. In a contest held yesterday at the Albert Hall to find the sexiest man on television called Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> nobody won. The pair wrote some of the Morecambe and Wise show in its BBC period, the 1972 and 1976 Christmas shows. I've kept a list of the insults oh, yes. against Des O'Connor. <laughs> Well, I've forgotten half of those. Oh, yeah. There's a whole series there. I shall read them one at a time. But we're leaving the country in August, aren't we? Yeah, we're going in August. <laughs> Number one, Eric. I've just heard some good news. Ernie, what good news? Eric, desicon has got a sore throat. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, Ernie, desicon is a self-made man. Eric, I think it's very nice of him to take the blame. <laughs> Number three, Eric, Des O'Connor is suffering from athlete's voice. Ernie, how do you mean, Eric? When you hear him sing, you want to run. <laughs> His most comfortable partnership was with Graham Chapman in the pre-Monty Python days. They wrote about 50 television shows together, including Doctor in the House and several for Ronnie Corbett's No, That's Me Over Here. Also for Now Look Here, BBC from 1971 to 73 and The Prince of Denmark for the BBC again in 1974. And with other writers he contributed to The Ronnie Corbett Show in 1987 and Ronnie Corbett in Bed in 1971 and was also part of the Two Ronnies team from 1971 to 1987. Can I be of assistance sir? Yes I'd like some tiles. Tiles sir? Yes bathroom tiles. Are these for fixing yourself, sir? Fixing myself? No, they're for drying myself. <laughs> Tiles. <laughs> you see, when you step out of the bath, you like to give yourself a brisk tiling dye. Towels, yes, uh, sir. That's it. I'll bring you a selection, sir. Excuse me a moment. Here. Hello, Charles. Hello, Aubrey, old boy. <laughs> Doing a bit of shopping, what? Rather, yes. Absolutely excellent place, this, isn't it? Tom? Yes. Everything for the heights. Yes, oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. I always come here for the old spice. Old spice, old boy. You're yes. in the wrong department. Surely that's on the second floor. Toiletries on the second no, floor. No, no, no. The old spice. The little woman. The spice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I, I come here. I'm here for the soup. Soup, yes. What kind of soup? Brine. Brine? Oh, brine's a little too salty for me, Brine. <laughs> no, brine. Brine. Brine wins her soup, old boy. <laughs> yes, the wife absolutely adores it. She yes. was born very near there, you see. Oh. She's a sly person. Well, Angela? Oh, I wouldn't say that. A little devious, perhaps, but not <laughs> sly. <laughs> sly. Born in sly. Maidenhead sly wins her. <laughs> Excellent food department here. Oh, there is. Yes. Oh, goodness me. Fish patties, game, cheeses. What's the matter, old boy? Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just seeing cheeses. Very good here. All rind. Oh, oh, good heavens, we never eat the rind. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, all rind, generally. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. All yes. rind, yes, yes, indeed. Mm. Have you heard about poor Rupert? Rupert? You don't mean Rupert Kimberly Dimbleby from Wimbledon? Yes, Kimbers Dimbles Wimbles, yes. <laughs> the last, I haven't heard about him for years. The last time I saw him, he was a little tight. What, drunk you mean? No, 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 he was a tight for a bookmaker, a little bookmaker's tight. <laughs> he was going round with a girl called Poopsy Benedict. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, no, he's left her now. Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. Consistently lied. Did she? Deceitful, was she? <laughs> no, no, consistently lied, lied. Noisy. Oh, noisy. <laughs> yes, yes, he's with, uh, he's with Dulcimer Padgett now. Ah. Mind you, he got into trouble. They were fined in the park. Fined? Fined for doing what? No, no, fined. <laughs> Discovered. Fined. <laughs> fined by the park keeper. Mm. And she was beside him on the grind. <laughs> <laughs> I see. That's 
that scandals. I never knew really what he saw in her. Well, he always maintained that she didn't have a frightfully attractive face. Mm. She had a wonderful mind. Well, let's say she had two wonderful minds. <laughs> Mile. <laughs> anyway, anyway, my brain, you got it up here. Oh, as far up as that, I eh? <laughs> And it's awfully nice to see you, Aubrey, old dear, oh, and have this absurd conversation with you. Why don't we go and have a drink, you pools? Oh, but what about your tires? Oh, I won't wait for them. Uh. What about a bite to eat? Yes, I'm a bite to eat myself. <laughs> quite, quite a big bite. <laughs> Listen, we must hurry, because as I came in, I saw a chap with a great placard saying, the end of the world is nigh. What, you mean absolutely right nigh? This very... <laughs> Kenny Everett. It's a... Oh, what an era that was. Happiest... One of the happiest times of my life working with Everett because he was the only non-comedian I ever wrote for. He was Kenny Everett. He was just a one-off. And, uh, oh, it was... That was, that was a great time. <laughs> Hello, creeps, it's, it's not here with some GBH for your flaming air. It's all in rhythm, it's all in rhyme. You wonder what I'm talking about half the time, it's a rap. Jack Cryer and the Kites. I'm here this evening with the Kites uh, to honour a person who's been the single most influential man in my life. Someone who has modelled for me intelligence, kindness and sensitivity whilst being an excellent communicator, public relations dream and a shrewd businessman to boot. He succeeded at everything he's attempted and has become something of a guru to me. His sage-like wisdom is legendary, not only within the comedy community, but also in the worlds of politics, sport and academia. <laughs> so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, I give you our dad, Barry Cryer. I know, I know you belong to somebody new, but tonight you belong to me. Although, although we're apart, you're part of my heart, but tonight seem once more just to dream in the silvery moonlight my honey I know I know in the dawn that you will be gone but tonight you belong to me little old me Uh, my name is Bob Cryer. I'm one of the easiest jobs I've ever had to do because every time you pick up the phone to ask people if they want to do a job for Dad, they, uh, they say yes, is the first thing. But if you meet people in person and you talk about Barry Cryer as your father, they always smile. 
and that's the greatest legacy anyone can give you. Um, I, uh, people often ask me what it was like growing up with Barry Cryer as your father. I said it was the same as everybody else's, just with better timing. <laughs> you keep coming back time and time again to see this man who has redefined the word silly and given us the best legacy any children could imagine. So, Dad, thank you very much. Hello, Central, give me Dr. Jeff. He's got what I need, I'll say he has. Oh, when the world goes wrong and I got those blues. He's the man that makes me get out of both my dancing shoes. Well, the more I get, the more I want. That was a tribute to Barry Cryer. I paid your doctor jazz in my dreams, in my dreams. When I'm trouble bound and mixed, he's the guy that gets me fixed. Hello, Central, give me doctor jazz.